Welcome to the Science Movie Club, where we bring up movies with scientific ideas, and today we'll take a look at The Bit Player. It's a movie about the life and works of Claude Shannon. Who's Claude Shannon? Who's Claude Shannon? Claude Shannon? You're asking me this question? I often go back to this, um, well, you've probably heard the word bit. We live in the information age, and he's the father of information theory. Doesn't everybody know who Claude Shannon is? If you value the fact that your iPhone can contact and call for you an Uber, and then place a phone call, and then text a friend, and then check your email, all of those things you owe to Claude Shannon and his work. Claude Shannon wrote several papers about communication and the theory of information. Machines can simulate thinking, and Shannon showed us how. Oh, and of course, spoiler alert. Claude Elwood Shannon was born in 1916 in Michigan and studied math and electrical engineering at the University of Michigan. It was there that he was introduced to the works of George Boole, aka Boolean Algebra. Very simply, Boolean Algebra works with only two variables, true and false, which can be represented as one for true and zero for false. But at the time, these were just rules for human thought. In 1937, Shannon was working on his master's at MIT while working on a differential analyzer, a fancy way of saying a computing machine. The electromechanical differential analyzer performs scientific and industrial marvels at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology. Perforated tape introduces the data to the 100-ton marvel, which solves problems beyond the ordinary methods of calculation. The thinking machine, which, well, officially it was called the differential analyzer, was uh, the smartest calculating machine of the time. With all sorts of uh, gears and rotating shafts and wheels and so on. It, it must have weighed 100 tons. My job was to set the different wheels and things to solve the equations. The heart of the machine, though, was the electric switches. Just like the switches you find in a telephone network to route calls. It occurred to me, because um, I'd taken a, uh, a Boolean algebra course in Michigan, that there was a beautiful parallel between electric switches, which are just uh, on, or off, uh, and Boolean algebra, which reduced everything to true and false. I used one for true and uh, zero for false. And uh, I worked out uh, the mathematics, which had some funny things like if uh, a true statement plus a true statement equals a true statement, <laughs> that means one plus one equals one. <laughs> um, I uh, wrote it all up for my master's thesis, and uh, uh, <laughs> that was the beginning of my great career. <laughs> Shannon's master's thesis is his first fundamental leap of insight. George Bull came up with laws of thought, and they were nice and beautiful, but Shannon was looking at electromechanical switches and what is the connection between laws of thought and switches? Well, Shannon realized they are the same thing. And that was just mind-boggling, because if the laws of thought could be implemented in switches, then it's not outlandish to surmise that at some point machines could think. So he applied the rules of Boolean algebra to these switches and opened the door for the idea that computing machines could also rely on rules of thinking. Essentially, machines can think. Well, kind of. Shannon was inspired by the works of Lewis Carroll, 
in the Alice in Wonderland books, and Edgar Allan Poe's The Gold Bug. In The Gold Bug, a man finds a scrap of paper with a coded message that tells where the pirate, Captain Kidd, buried his treasure. The message is written in invisible ink, though, and only appears when it's held up to a flame. Poe shows how you can break the code by connecting the most used symbols to the most used letters in English. This led him to realize that not only does the English language rely on redundancies or repeated letters and phrases that could be dropped and still retain information, but that information in general could be compressed. During World War II, Shannon met and discussed ideas with Alan Turing, who was also using the idea of letter frequency in messages to decode the German Enigma machine. Be sure to check out our video about machine thinking for more about Alan Turing. But after the war, Shannon got a job working for Bell Labs, the largest telephone company in the United States. Their main focus was on communication, and the way he understood it, the point of communication was to get a message from point A to point B. The big breakthrough in communication came when the telegram was invented. It used electrical signals to send from one location to another. One of the inventors, Samuel Morse, came up with a code which allowed one to communicate using this machine. Morse also relied on letter frequency in English, going to print shops to find out what was the most commonly used letters. E, the most common letter, gets the shortest code, dot. T, the second most common, uh, gets the dash, uh, and uh, so on. Exactly the sort of things I was thinking. This was the first step, a hundred years before Shannon, because it reduced all the symbols in English to just two, a dot and a dash, a system which is called a binary code. In 1948, Shannon published a paper called A Mathematical Theory of Communication, which explained that all information could be represented as either one or zero, true or false. The information, which they called intelligence at the time, was a slippery concept. I wanted to try to find a way to treat information like a physical thing, like energy that you could measure. What I realized was that to measure information, uh, you have to look at it without regard uh, to meaning. Uh, that upset a lot of people, uh, that content is irrelevant. The point of sending a message is to remove uncertainty, something you didn't know, but now you know. Do you have a coin, Michelle? A, a coin? Uh, yes, a coin. I'd get up to get one myself, but I know. You'll just tell me to sit back down. <laughs> um, yes. <clears throat> Heads or tails? Tails. Heads. A coin toss is an example of the simplest form of information to communicate. A binary choice. True or false. Heads or tails. A one or a zero. A bit. Shannon's big idea number one, 
convert all information to bits. All information can be represented as zeros and ones. Pictures, music, video, all information can be treated the same way. Is your coin legal? Sorry? Your coin's not counterfeit, is it? Um, not that I know of. So, if I toss it a hundred times, each time I toss it, there's an equal probability that it's a head or a tail. Uh, I'd need a hundred bits of information, one for each toss, to communicate the results. Now, if it turns out you're some sort of a calm woman, and you thought it might be fun to uh, pull the wool over some gullible old man's eyes... <laughs> Heads, right? It's heads on both sides. Uh, I didn't need any information from you to know the result. If something's completely predictable, there's zero information. But if, on the other hand, if something's completely random, you need information about everything. It's counterintuitive, but the, the gibberish contains more information than great literature. At the time, Bell Labs was working on how to transmit information without losing the signal to external noise. Shannon drew a simple diagram which explained that using this code, you can send any message and mathematically predict what the message is to remove any errors. This combined the idea of Boolean algebra in how machines think and letter frequency in how to send the messages. This led to a revolution in communication and how we as a society looked at information. He drew a very simple diagram. You have some information you want to send, and you have to convert it into something like sound waves or electrical pulses or light that can be sent over a channel, a medium like air or wires. There's things that can disrupt the signal on that medium, like static or smoke or noise, before it gets to the receiver. And then the receiver converts the signal back into something that's hopefully really close to the original message. The diagram looked trivial, but it allowed Shannon to break the problem of communication down into its essential parts and create a universal theory that you can apply to anything you want. The problem of communication reduces to just two things. How do I convert things to zeros and ones? And how do I make sure that those zeros and ones get through accurately? Shannon's third big idea, huge idea, use mathematics to eliminate noise. This seemed crazy. What does that even mean? He proved that mathematics could eliminate errors from static and interference. You could use mathematical codes to overcome noise. And then, as the icing on the cake, Shannon claimed this could work right up to the Shannon limit. If you could find the right codes, you could have perfect communication with as little errors as you wanted. And that was the revolution. Now that us humans were learning how machines think and act like humans, Shannon set out on different inventions that were the precursors to modern computers and devices. In 1950, he built Thesis, a thinking mouse that using electrical signals could find its way out of a maze. And he also built a computer which could play chess, leading to the defeat of a human chess player against an IBM computer. I'm Claude Shannon, a mathematician here at the Bell Telephone Laboratories. 
This is Theseus. Theseus is an electrically controlled mouse. He has the ability to solve a certain class of problems by trial and error means, and then remember the solution. In other words, he can learn from experience. Like his classical namesake, Theseus has a problem with finding his way through a maze. The mouse moves by this electromagnet and its brain and these switches. Shannon's theory of information is more complex and can be covered in one video. But the one takeaway is how influential this man and his works really were in allowing us to have the technology we have today, including the fact that you're watching this video on YouTube on your device. We mentioned thinking machines and the IBM computer, but for that, we need to focus on other scientists, events, and movies coming up. If you learned something you didn't know in this video, be sure to let me know what that was by leaving a comment down below. Let me know which movie you think we should cover next.